Hello and welcome to this episode of Keeping Her Keys. Today I'm going to be talking about the history of Hecate and how her historical depictions can intersect with when we are called to Hecate and how we can craft our own understanding of Hecate based on our personal experience, what's sometimes called personal gnosis, that's G-N-O-S-I-S, gnosis, and where this all can lead for us to have a truly deep uh, spiritual practice, a deep experience of wholeness within ourselves, and a sense of equanimity that we are connected in a enriching way to both the dark and the light within and without as above so below as within so without so let's begin um, i invite you if you have a candle handy you can light your candle and if not, you can just uh, share in my flame if you wish, or you can do the motions with your hand. In honor of Hecate's most commonly known form, which is the three-part goddess, night, day, the in-between, past, present, future, maiden, mother, crone, guardian, guide, gatekeeper, so many interpretations of the triple goddess as relating to Hecate. I do a simple ceremony at the beginning of everything, meetings, these recordings, classes, everything I do, my day with, with what I call the triformis ritual. And I describe that in my book, Entering Hecate's Garden. And if you're in Covina, my school, you'll be well accustomed to this practice. So the simple practice consists of the three parts of um, energy or magic. That is the cleansing, banishing, purification, the protecting, connecting, and then the invocation or the intention. You know, that is what is being created now that we have cleansed space and circled space what what is the energy that we are amplifying so it's the triformis triformis is an epithet of hecate coming to us from ancient times that means three formed so we do the three formed ritual to set our space create intention and to connect and it is also a way to connect to Hecate's triple nature and to honor her. So if you have a candle, um, do it along with me or use your hands or simply watch and just soften into our time together. So usually we, we wanna do this with the left hand. Um, <clears throat> left hand is often associated with cleansing, banishing, you may have heard of the term left hand path and so on. So we start with our left hand and work counterclockwise. Just calling upon that energy of cleansing, see that flame burning away, whatever is blocking and binding. Doing this in repetitions of threes is lovely as well. And then we switch hands and cast the circle in a clockwise motion. And this is the energy of protection, seeing that flame as nourishment. And it's also the energy of connection. As we connect here through this recording and other ways. And if you have any questions about these episodes 
or if you have suggestions, email me at info at keepingherkeys.com. That is a way that we can connect. And then we have an invocation or an intention setting part, the third part of the ritual. And today I am going to uh, share the opening poem from my book that is coming out very soon. It's about to go to the printer, super excited. I don't even have paper copies of it yet. So I'm going to be reading from the PDF. And this is the opening poem from that book, which is the psycho-spiritual journey through Hecate's cave, through personal exploration, deep inquiry and ritual. She is the darkness and she is the fire. She is the cry of enough. She is the sigil written in stone. She is the silent walking away of the betrayed. She is the lonely raising arms to the moon. She is the lie told to live the truth. She is the secret circle drawing down her moon. She is the poison that heals. She is the bold stare into the mirror. She is the blood shed to bring rebirth. She is all those who dare to become. She is the power that is our right. She has returned. Answer her call. The time is now. Speak the truth and be healed. In that poem, I was attempting to capture my personal experience of Hecate, the experiences of Hecate I've noted in my students and followers over the past many years, and also connect to the historical portrayals of Hecate, both in first person accounts, like a collection of ancient spells and rituals known as the Greek magical papyri, in fictional uh, tales told about her, such as myths, and probably uh, most poignant for me personally is in uh, the Homeric hymn to Demeter, where Hecate is portrayed as this divine mediator between uh, Persephone and her upcoming underworld journey, the predicament she finds herself in after she's the, the uh, victim of violence and so on. So as we go into de de discussing the historical depictions of Hecate, I want you to know that um, some of this is difficult territory we'll be entering. I'll be discussing the history of the witch, because the witch, of course, is very associated with Hecate. I'll be discussing um, marginalized people and the violence and so on that typically befalls people who don't fit the mainstream. And also discussing how the sacred feminine was systematically, institutionally uh, denigrated over hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of years we still kind of live in the the shadow of that today of course so this can be some difficult territory that we're going into take a breath and uh let's explore together maybe we should have some sacred smoke let's get the smoke going i have Things from the garden, garlic skins, wormwood, rose petals, a little bit of mugwort in the cauldron. So I offer you this sacred smoke just to settle us in to discussing the history of Hecate together. The earliest <coughs> When we talk about Hecate's origins, I think I want to kind of scaffold this by saying 
that Hecate is commonly described as a Greek goddess. That is not wrong. She certainly was known to the Greeks and in certain parts of the ancient Greek empire, she was incredibly important. Um, however, her origins lie in the mists of the past, well before the Greek empire was established. It is most commonly believed by scholars that Hecate was an Anatolian goddess, that her origins lay in this area of what is modern day Turkey, and indeed the only surviving temple dedicated primarily to Hecate is in Turkey. So while it's not incorrect to say that she was a Greek goddess, the Greeks didn't invent her. As with most things in the Greek world, they adapted, borrowed, stole from pre-existing cultures. The Greeks were avid explorers, adventurers, warriors that were traveling far beyond, you know, that little peninsula and associated islands. So let's imagine Let's imagine the Mediterranean Sea and locate Greece and then look to the lands around it. This would have been the area where Hecate was known. And then, of course, with the rise of Rome, she became known to the ancient Romans and then she was transformed in different ways and kind of persisted as the Roman Empire um, spread throughout Europe. She be, what we may have seen as Hecate evolved into goddesses, saints, and so on, known by different names. So there is this lineage of Hecate that stretches way, way back at least 3,000 years. And then if we want to keep going back further, um, the idea of a great mother goddess figure who was both light and dark, death and birth, and all the spaces in between. Um, and I'm referring here to the work of uh, Gimboltus and others who did this groundbreaking anthropological work archaeological work, um, exploring the great mother well beyond um, the ancient Greeks, and even, uh, you know, kind of the, the errors immediately preceding the time of the Greeks. So we are, where the Greeks enter the picture is roughly 2,500 years ago. And that is where there starts to be documentation specifically calling Hecate by name and referring to her as what we could define as a great mother goddess figure. The earliest record that specifically discusses Hecate at length is from Hesiod's Theogony. T-H-E-O-G-O-N-Y. You can probably find a public domain copy of it if you're interested in diving into that. In the Theogony, she is described as a goddess who oversees many things. Um, she is involved with civic life, the city, the harbor. She is a goddess that can grant boons and favors. There is no evidence of, you know, the scary, frightening Hecate that comes later on. She's very powerful. And from the Theogony, the next major source, I would say, is the Homeric Hymn to Demeter, where um, Hecate emerges from her cave 
to console Persephone. So in this story, a young, innocent Persephone has been sexually violated by Hades. Hades had made an agreement with Persephone's dad, Zeus, behind Persephone's mom's back, Demeter. And after this, Persephone was understandably bereft and she was all alone. She had been abandoned by her companions. Uh, Demeter had gone off in a fit of fury. And as she is crying in this tale, uh, Hecate emerges from her cave to give Persephone succor. And as the story progresses, Hecate continues to play a mediational role, negotiating you know, with the powers that be um, about the necessity of Persephone to marry Hades and become queen of the underworld. And that in some ways, Hecate plays this very important role that is much like um, a psychologist or a therapist or a wise auntie or even a crone, you know, a wise woman figure, although in the story she is not depicted as aged. With each passing season, of course, Persephone alights from the underworld and it is Hecate in some versions of this story that guides her back and forth. So that Hecate is the force, the spirit that navigates what is underground, what is interior and so on with what is bright and growing and solar. So that is, that comes along, not, historians believe it comes along, I think, shortly after Hesiod's Theogony. So we're still talking well over 2,000 years ago. Around that same time, broadly speaking, um, the Orphic hymns are written. And the Orphic hymns are an interesting and so evocative collection of verses written to various deities. There is a long discussion around the origins and so on that I won't get into, but if you're interested in that, you can look that up. The most interesting thing for me about the Orphic hymns is how Hecate is positioned in them. That in the Orphic hymns, there are two opening hymns. One is to Hecate, and then the next one is to uh, Propylaea. I think in some translations they use a slightly different term, but the term means uh, the feminine gatekeeper, or we might even say the keeper of the keys, the, 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 the feminine figure who watches over thresholds. And Hecate is very much associated with this role. So my personal belief is that Hecate comes first. She is that spirit, that mediating spirit that when they were constructing, you know, organizing these hymns to put Hecate first was indicative that she was the spirit that helped you get to all the other spirits. So in a sense, she is the primordial spirit. And then to have the gatekeeper him after is just an amplification of Hecate. She is this amazing force, you know, and in the Orphic hymn, the author talks about her being the keeper of the keys um, and that, you know, she is terrifying yet also lovely and it's so beautiful. And then in the Propylaea one, she takes on this role of being the gatekeeper and also um, Elethea, which is a term, there's different ways to translate this 
that title, Aletheia was also a goddess unto herself in some aspects, but there's different ways to translate it into English. Um, I typically spell it E-I-L-Y-T-H-E-I-A, Aletheia. I think I got all the E's and I's in there. So Aletheia is the divine midwife. She is the one who watches over birth, um, helps pregnant people, and so on. So Propylaea is associated with not merely the physical threshold, but the threshold of pregnancy and childbirth of bringing a spirit into the world, bringing a life into the world, and then also associated, not so much in this particular hymn, but in other sources, um, with the psychopomp role, which is the scene of souls from this life to the other side. So there is this setup, if you like, in the Orphic hymns at the very beginning, describing Hecate, in this way that she has all of these powers and clearly portraying her as what I would classify as a great mother figure. You know, great mother, that is a term that comes um, from like archaeology and anthropology, even depth psychology, such as the work from Eric Neumann in the 1950s. Um, so the great mother is both both light and dark and so on, like I previously mentioned, she is a total totality. She's not a goddess that is kind of slivered and is in charge of this or is in charge of that. She encompasses all that is um, traditionally viewed as feminine. So that comes then. So this, so we have this set up. So far we've traveled probably about a thousand years. Um, and now we're approaching, let's say, um, the end of the pre-common era and coming into the common era. So this can be a little bit confusing, too, to call it before the common era and common era. A lot of us grew up with the annotations of B.C. and A.D. to depict uh, when it was believed that Christ walked the earth and then died and was resurrected. So we used to have time BC and AD, but now we typically use BCE and CE as a dividing line for before and after the common era. Still a little bit confusing and odd. Um, so as we approach this, we need to just pause for a moment and think about what was happening in that world at the time. The Greek Empire had reached its pinnacle. It was declining, but it had spread widely so that most areas in the ancient Mediterranean had been exposed to Greek culture to some extent. By this time as well, practice in certain areas of the ancient Mediterranean around honoring Hecate with rituals on the dark moon. Those practices would have been well established. And in certain places, um, it is believed that there were well established cults of Hecate. And that these cults, by this time, were continuing to see Hecate, of course, as this great mother figure associated with um, midwifery, pregnancy, her role as Chorotrophus would have been well entrenched by this time too. Chorotrophus means guardian of children. And concurrently, her role as psychopomp, the one who guides souls to the other side, much as she did in, with Persephone, that role would have been well entrenched in the understanding of Hecate. Also to note, by this time, there were popular plays 
that had been written that advanced Hecate's governance over sorcery, magic, and uh, pharmacaea. Most particularly, Euripides' Medea was incredibly popular and remains incredibly popular. I went to the opera last month and saw a new production of Medea uh, from the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. So Medea remains with us, and in Medea, she summons Hecate uh, and is considered a spiritual daughter to Hecate. And in my book, Entering Hecate's Garden, I actually channeled a message from Medea to open the book, and Medea is very much part of that book. So, it, so this is, was a popular play, and this really kind of cemented in the mind of people back then, Hecate's association with witchcraft and what we might call the shadow self. Certainly Medea is all about shadows and longing. And I have a separate episode um, I did with mythologist Angela Natividad all about Medea. So if you want more Medea, you can find that. There was also the popularity of the Odyssey, um, which is very, very old, in which Cerse, or Kerke, uh, for a more Greek style pronunciation, that she was deeply involved with Hecate as well. So we have these two witches, and it was Hecate and those two witches as her spiritual daughter, although in some stories they are her actual daughters. Um, so there is this floating around in the popular culture back then. And there's many other plays and works of fiction that reinforce this idea that Hecate is the queen of witches. They wouldn't, of course, use the word witches. They would have used the word pharmaca or sorceress. And that magic is very much in her domain. So there is this frightening aspect of Hecate that is percolating in the culture then as well. So in some areas, you know, she may be revered as a more frightening goddess and in other areas she was not seen that way such as for example from the historical records at the temple in turkey at Lagina, where and again you know we're talking about this kind of historical era approaching the common era now so about two thousand years ago a little bit euripides is older than that but by a few centuries, but the story of Medea actually is even older than Euripides' play. So we're we're still dealing with this hunk of history <clears throat> that started with the with the Theogony by Hesiod to the Common Era. So we're talking about a thousand years. If you can imagine, if you think back to a thousand years ago from twenty twenty two, where we are today. That is the whole stretch of history that I'm discussing. So it's a big, big stretch of history. And that is where a lot of our modern understanding of Hecate is rooted in that period. And we also have archaeological finds um, that are objects associated with Hecate, such as the Pergamon tablet, P-E-R-G-A-M-M-O-N, -E I think, tablet, if you want to look that up, um, statues and iconography, um, and those fabulous magical gems, which are one of my favorite things, that depict her. So we have kind of written um, sources in ancient Greek um, and other languages, even Hebrew and 
course, go, getting into the Roman era, we get into Latin and Egyptian. So we these are all written in different languages. And then there's also imagery of Hecate all coming up to this time. And then we get into the kind of straddling the common era. And I want to talk about um, this collection of magical fragments known as the Greek magical papyri, wherein Hecate is often um, invoked for spells and rituals. So this is a collection of papyri that were found in Egypt and subsequently um, translated. And in here, it really solidifies Hecate's place um, in magic. So that kind of covers that whole section. It, uh, it's believed that the ages of these papyri kind of cover several hundred years. So there is that whole kind of collection of sources about ancient Hecate that straddle about 1500 years where she is specifically named. And then of course her roots go all the way back to like the Neolithic goddesses and so on, you know, so her roots straddle very, very far back, but there is this period of history where the Greeks adopted her. She was popularized in different ways, such as the practice of uh, doing a atrop atropaic ritual on the dark moon, which was to honor Hecate, to prop propitiate Hecate, in order to keep the house protected and safe for the coming month. And indeed, if you look at a Hellenic uh, religious calendar today, you will still see Dipnon, Hecate's Dipnon. Dipnon means supper, so Hecate's supper on the night um, in which the astrological new moon follows. So there is practices, there's literary sources, there's artistic sources, and then there's like firsthand practitioner reports. This is what we have so far, this kind of collection of different sources. And then we go to something very different. Again, we're in the common era now. So probably about 1800 years ago, where there is a collection of fragments coming from uh, a different area, era, sorry, different area that's come to be known as the Chaldean Oracles. Sometimes it has other names, but most commonly known as the Chaldean Oracles. And Chaldean is spelled C-H-A-L-D-E-A-N. And in these oracles, Hecate is portrayed as Anima Mundi, the feminine soul of the world. The oracles are a philosophical treatise that uh, explores how the universe works and our place within it. In the oracles, Hecate is seen as a divine feminine force from whom flows the physical world, basically. And that she is a mediator, a membrane between us and the father or the masculine principle, if you prefer a more psychological term. And for the authors, there is some discussion about who actually authored the Chaldean oracles. For the authors of the oracles, 
I believe their big question was, you know, what's the meaning of life? Where are we going? Um, and that this channel that's often viewed as being a channeled or sacred text that came through scribes that uh, opened themselves up to this kind of divine knowledge. It puts me to mind of like the modern idea or understanding, or it's kind of like in the, the culture of the Akashic records, you know, that there is this divine library and the oracles tapped into that. And in, in the oracles, again, Hecate is this divine sacred feminine force through which the world flows. And she is also membrane mediator between mortals and the physical world and the more ascended world of the father, the higher self, we would have different terms for it today than what the authors of the oracles used. So the so that is a very interesting depiction of Hecate, especially if we are considering that this is a sacred text, it's a channeled text, it's not like the PGM where it's a practitioner uh, writing basically their own grimoire or their own book of spells and rituals. This is channeled information about how the universe is structured vis-a-vis -vis the PGM, which is believed to be a grimoire. And we're stacking these two sources on top of like the theogony, which was, here's who the gods are and what they're in charge of. Um, and then the, the, the fictional, the plays um, and the Orphic hymns. So we're stacking all of these things together. And myself being a researcher, um, I, you know, I do qualitative explorations of all of these sources and allow themes to emerge from them. This is a lot, right? This is a lot to take in. I think some of the biggest themes, if we, again, we're straddling probably about 1500 years of history now, that some of the themes that emerge is that Hecate is some sort of mediator. You know, she is, she is not the star of the show. She's not Persephone. She's not Medea. She's not Circe. But she is the one who is greater um, that is turned to in times of dire need. She is associated with the deeper world of spirits. She is associated with healing. And she is also associated with uh, what we might consider baneful. She can be protective, she can be destructive, and she is a very, very complex figure. She's also, some of the things I haven't talked about, but I wanna mention before we kind of shift um, more towards coming to where we are today with what people think about Hecate, that She's associated with dreams. She's associated with healing. And she is very associated with herbalism, what we might call herbalism, or we might call magical herbalism today. She is also strongly associated with what I like to call her horde. And this horde is a band of restless spirits the unquiet dead, um, you know, in the ancient thinking, you know, spirits, harmful spirits, spirits who never knew flesh. Hecate was also known by some to be associated with this type of 
spirit. And again, if we look at what is the source of this information, you know, there is this kind of mixed bag of firsthand accounts like the PGM, and then also works of literature that describe her association. So if we look to fiction as fact, and if fiction reflects what actual people believed about Hecate at the time, then there is this kind of nefarious side to her as well. She's a very, very complex figure. But if we look to practice, one of the practices we know is this ritual um, happening on the new moon. And then we also know about the rituals and practices of the temple at Lagina that survives to today because they left amazing records, things written right on the walls. It's really quite stunning. So Hecate remains really complex. We have at Lagina, she is this great mother figure in other areas. She is more nefarious. Her role as keeper of the keys of the universe. You can see how that plays out in the Chaldean oracles, keeping of the keys of the, the gatekeeper to the deeper world. You can see how this plays out with magic, dreams, and so on. So there is all of this kind of emergent energy of Hecate as being the one who governs like these entrances, whether physical entrances to the home, and again, you know, she was also known as a road goddess during the ancient time too, um, connected to Enodia or Enodea, who was a goddess with origins slightly north, um, a Thessalian goddess, older origins that the Greeks also adapted, and so on. So it, it gets very, very complicated, but the themes I would like to say she is associated with the in between gatekeeper keeper of the keys. Um, the deeper world magic. restless spirits. Uh, pregnancy childbirth protection of children healing. And she is a very protective spirit as well, so we have and then also. This idea of the world soul that is kind of like this great mediating force. This is where we are. So now we are moving into the days of the Roman Empire. I want to note before we kind of hop peninsulas um, in the Mediterranean to from Greece to uh, the Italian peninsula. I think that's what it's called. Um, that. You know, her connection to certain goddesses needs to be kind of thrown into our cauldron of what we're discussing today. She's deeply connected to uh, Greek Artemis, but there's also a different Artemis um, who was more of a mother figure. So the Olympic, so the kind of the Artemis we probably all know from myths and pop culture is, you know, she's young, she's the huntress, she's um, very pro-feminine, she's what we might call today, you know, she's like queer. Um, there's that Artemis, but there was also Artemis who was much more like Hecate. And depending on where the author or the art maker lived, in the ancient Mediterranean, that's how they understood Artemis. Much like, you know, today we can understand different figures, you know, different pop culture figures very differently based on our personal understanding. Back then, of course, like geography was one of the major, major influences on uh, what you would know. So Artemis and Hecate 
in different areas of the ancient Mediterranean were very, very closely connected. And for me, after all these years of studying this, I would say in some places that they are actually one and the same, that, they, that Artemis may be Hecate and Hec or Hecate may be Artemis, um, and that they're just different titles of each other. And it's a bit difficult to suss out, you know, if, we, if you even wanted to suss out, I don't want to suss out, um, which one would be the proper term. It doesn't matter to me. So that there's this, they, they use this word conflation, uh, which I don't particularly care for. Um, I like entwined. So I don't think she's conflated. I don't think she's confused. I think that the writers of those texts, I feel a kinship with them, that they were grappling with faces of the sacred feminine and using different names for it. Much like today, we may, you know, the chant Hecate, carriage wind, come to us, let us be reborn. Um, we're not ne necessarily talking about like goddesses that live in separate silos. We're talking about understanding this great mother goddess figure with different faces. And that's what I think is going on in those ancient texts. I don't think anybody was confused. Or maybe in some places they were, but I don't believe it. So this association that Hecate has with Artemis is very important as we kind of transfer our time machine ride to ancient Rome. Ancient Rome, much like the ancient Greeks did, adapted a lot of everything in their life, their culture, from cultures that they traveled to. So in Rome, eventually, so again, we're moving into the first centuries of the Common Era. So in Rome, eventually, Hecate and Artemis are transformed into different goddesses. Um, but keeping like this compilation of powers associated with them, but it's just kind of being assigned to specific goddesses. So the, I call this like the flat lining of the sacred feminine, where there were this complexities and richness and diversity through the Greek era into the Roman era. All of this becomes squishy. And whatever is dark and mysterious becomes off limits and to be feared, reviled and so on. So this is happening. Artemis, a lot of her attributes get transferred to this goddess Diana. But since Artemis and Hecate are so entwined, you know, certain Hecatean aspects also become associated with Diana. And then you can even see if we want to project this far into the future, like with Leland's work, um, you know, Diana being queen of the witches and so on. So that is what's happening. But then there are other aspects of Hecate, specifically about her governance of crossroads, journeys, roads, that becomes associated with a figure known as trivia, which means of the three ways. So you see this triplicity continuing to translate so that brings us into the roman world um i want to make one more note before i kind of wrap up this one and i'll do i'll bring hecate into modern life in the next part of this episode that there was also the hecate in egypt Right, because the Greek magical papyri comes out of Egypt, and that there is evidence of temples to Hecate in Egypt, and that of course the Egyptians went forth into the world, the ancient Romans went forth into the world, and they went north. The Romans 
expanded their empire throughout Europe, um, going all the way, you know, to the United, what we know now as the United Kingdom and probably beyond. So we have this complex Hecate, Diana, Trivia, um, even uh, Clotina, goddess of sewers. So the Romans are carrying on what the ancients ascribed to Hecate. They're sometimes using different names for this goddess. And simultaneously, as the cult of the sun god grew, so in Greece, it was Apollo, and then the Romans liked this idea too. Um, and there are other male sun gods, cults that were arising. As this focus on the solar and the denial of the dark grew, along with progress, civilization, acquisition of wealth, um, cities, as all of this became more entrenched, what was seen as feminine, which is lunar, the dark, messy, um, you know, all of those things, uncivilized, wild women, all of that business, as all of that became more entrenched and the solar god became more popular and the solar god served the needs of the state, that the feminine in general was subjugated to a lot of this and the goddess, however you want to portray her, um, got anything that was kind of messy about her or lunar or witchy, um, reassigned to goddesses that were just scary bad to be avoided by these ancients. So that's kind of where we're at in the second episode. I will uh, take us into the Christian era and sorry, in the second part of this episode, I'll take us into the Christian era and to where we are today in understanding Hecate. I hope you've enjoyed this talk about the historical origins of Hecate.